Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome. The good news is that the images from last week's lecture are available to take, uh, take after, after this lecture, as well as the notes and the images for this lecture. I know a lot of people were disappointed last, last time not to have the images. They are now available for you to take. Just to remind you of the focus of this series of lectures, uh, it is the breakdown of what the art critic Peter Fuller called the symbolic order with the birth of modernism. Uh, the lack of any widely accepted and understood set of images so that all the artists that we are considering have had to develop very much their own individual style in response to this. But the three artists which we are considering today not only developed their own very distinctive style, they also had a very distinctive kind of religious vision which doesn't fit into uh, any kind of usual uh, category. Last week uh, we considered, after a, a brief introduction with the German Expressionists, Epstein the Jew and uh, Ruo, a very, very devout uh, Catholic. Uh, this week we're moving uh, away from uh, what you might call accepted uh, orthodoxies. Uh, first of all then, I'm beginning with uh, Chagall, uh, born in 1887, who lived until 1985. This is called Self-Portrait with Seven uh, Fingers. <laughs> Chagall was born in the little uh, town of Vitevsk uh, in uh, Russia. Uh, and from his early childhood, he was fascinated by this town. He loved to walk around it, sit on the fence, and see what was uh, going, going on. After a period in Paris, he returned to Vitebsk again, and, and once again was enthralled by the sights uh, that he saw. And those of you who are familiar with the paintings of Chagall will know that these images recur uh, throughout his life in all his paintings. One of the most familiar images, of course, of his paintings is the cow. And for instance, in his uh, uh, autobiography called My Life, written when he was 35, uh, he said he couldn't help noticing the kosher butcher in the village. And he wrote, and you, little cow, naked and crucified, you are dreaming in heaven. The glittering knife has raised you to the skies. So I think that lies behind that familiar image of Chagall of cows in the uh, sky. An equally familiar image, of course, was the uh, violinist. He heard his uncles and others playing the, the violin, and he wrote, My head floats above the room on its own. Transparent ceiling, clouds and blue stars steal along with the smell of the fields, the stable, and the birds. Vitesk is full of synagogues, and religion was absolutely fundamental to the life of his family both his grandfather and his father being very uh, devout. And the yearly cycle of religious feasts, uh, like uh, tabernacles, uh, was very much part of his living experience. Uh, and at Passover, his father tells him, as they do, as you know, at Passover in the Jewish community, to open the door to let Elijah in. And he wrote, where is Elijah and his white chariot? Is he still waiting in the courtyard, perhaps to enter the house in the guise of a wretched old man, a hunchback beggar, with a pack on his back and a stick on his, in his hand? Here am I am, where is my glass of wine? And again, this was another very familiar uh, image in Chagall's paintings, that of uh, El Elijah. And this closed but joyous world of Hasidic Judaism was to Lee Chagall with an intense mystical feel for life, together with a sense of sadness at its destruction. This is called Solitude, painted in 1933, actually before the destruction, of course, really began. Chagall's mother bribed a teacher at the Russian school with, school with 50 rubles to take her son, and this was the first step out of the closed world of his childhood. After that, he won a scholarship to a local uh, art school, uh, and uh, from then on he fought his way, overcoming the rejection he experienced as, as being a, a Jew, overcoming the extreme poverty of his family, 
He moved first to St. Petersburg and then to Paris, where he found his artistic liberation in the city. And this, of course, dates from his time uh, in, uh, in Paris. But after a time uh, in, in, in Paris, he went back to uh, Vitesk. And one of the things that struck him uh, as a young child and later on were the churches in Vitesk. Uh, he said, I always enjoy painting that church and that little hill again in my uh, pictures. You can see Elijah above there, of course, can't you? And clearly the presence of these churches and their icons had something to do with the fact that later he was to use so much Christian as well as Jewish imagery in his art. He said he wanted to ask the chief rabbi some questions, including what he thought about Christ, whose pale face had long been troubling me. When he went back to uh, Vitesk, uh, he intended only staying a few days. But in fact, uh, because of the war, he ended up staying eight years. He spent some time in the army, and then after the Russian Revolution, he was appointed commissar of an art school in Vitesk. But his art didn't really fit what was required at the time. And so, in the ensuing chaos, he left for, first for Paris and then for the United States. However, whilst he was back in Vitesse, he married his great love, Bella. Uh, there, of course, is Bella, who was to form an inspiration for so many of his paintings. Uh, she was from a wealthy family who disapproved of the marriage, but, in fact, won a family that lost everything in the revolution. But uh, Chagall said about her, I only had to open my window and blue air, love and flowers entered with her, dressed all in white or all in black, She'd been long flying over my canvases, guiding my art. And we see that love again a little bit later in this painting called The Three Candles from 1938-39, where this is a cherishing, protective love uh, in a Europe which is very, very threatened. Now, Chagall began combining Jewish and Christian iconography early in his career, as, as here, where a distinctly Christian figure of Lazarus is combined with the symbols of a Jewish uh, burial. But it was with Golgotha, and the Finnish ske sketch is called Calvary, uh, that he firmly established himself in the avant-garde. This is unlike uh, any other crucifixion up to that point, or indeed since that uh, point. He paints Jesus as a child uh, on the cross, uh, and this was a very important symbolic image for Chagall. The symbolic figure he wrote of Christ has always been very familiar to me, and I was determined to give form to it in the guise imagined by a young heart. I wanted to show Christ as uh, an innocent uh, child. So um, this is very interesting from all sorts of ways. It obviously it combines some classical imagery as well, I think, because that boat there may very well be uh, chair on the ferrymen uh, guiding uh, people over the the uh, the river Styx to the land of the of, of the dead, um, but it is with this painting that he gave most powerful expression uh, to his conjunction of Jewish and Christian uh, imagery. It's called the White Crucifixion. It's in the Chicago Museum of of Modern Art. Now, if you look at that, at the bottom, obviously, uh, there's a Jewish candlestick there. Uh, moving round in an anti-clockwise direction, you have a figure of Elijah there as a beggar, jumping over uh, an unrolling scroll from which co is coming a great white light. Moving up, there are Jewish houses and synagogues, synagogue being burnt there. Over to the top, there are Jewish figures wailing. Over to the left, there are Soviet stormtroopers and houses being burnt. A little further down, uh, you see a boat of refugees, trying, Jewish refugees, trying to get to Palestine. And on the bottom uh, corner is our two Jewish figures, which originally had inscribed on those white placards, I am Jewish. But obviously dominating the picture is a, uh, a very, very Jewish Jesus on the cross, dressed in a Jewish shawl. 
Chagall painted this in 1938 when he experienced the beginning of the pogroms against Jewish people uh, in, in Europe. And it's a question, I think, as to what, what is he really trying to say by this very, very dramatic use of such a powerful Christian symbol in the middle of Jewish suffering. You have to bear in mind, of course, that the image of Christ on the cross was sheer terror for most Jews, really, right, right until the 19th century, because particularly in the medieval period, uh, during Easter week, Christians would come into the Jewish ghettos uh, and with crosses, Christ on the cross, uh, and terrify the people there. I think a positive interpretation, obviously a Christian interpretation of this picture, uh, is that is, this is Jesus the Jew suffering uh, with his own uh, people. And it's interesting that in Russia at the turn of the century, there was a Jew, uh, Mark Antokolsky, uh, who, who letters reveal how we struggle to reconcile a Jewish and a Christian uh, viewpoint. Uh, he saw Jesus as uh, one in the line of great biblical prophets and welcomed the love which he, uh, which he showed. And many people had hopes for Chagall himself that he would develop into a new Antikoloski, uh, somebody who, who was, as it were, able to show Jesus in a, as a Jew uh, uh, at, at the same time as remaining faithful to his uh, Judaism. Now, Chagall went on combining Jewish and Christian uh, imagery, as we see in this crucifixion from 1940, this, the martyr from 1940, this, the martyr from 1970, this yellow crucifixion from 1943, and this Apocalypse in Lila's Capriccio from 1945. This has only just recently been shown in London for the first time at the Ben Uri Gallery. Gallery. It's quite a, a sharp, painful picture. Painfully, painful image, painted probably after the opening up of the concentration camps and a realization of what had happened. The scenes of Jewish suffering on the right the Nazi has no hand and a tail, uh, and uh, Jesus on the cross has a sort of feminine figure, suggestive of the wives he loved. The clock seems to be stuck at the end of time. The familiar ladder appears. Then this is the painter and Christ, painted in 1951. And this is another one in front of the picture in which Chagall himself appears, as well as his parents looking over from the back, and Bella, his wife, on one side as you look in. Because Chagall also seemed to have a very strong sense of identity uh, between himself and and, and Christ in some way. And then just, uh, th then uh, there is, to change the, the, the imagery slightly, there is this, the Exodus, painted in 1952 to six, 1966. On the right um, are scenes from biblical history, while on the left are pictures from contemporary hardship, perhaps in part reflecting the founding of the State of Israel and ga Jews gathering to it from persecution in places like Russia. But of course, what is most startling about this exodus, is instead of Moses, who's simply uh, a, a very small figure uh, down on the uh, right-hand side down there, uh, you have uh, an uh, iconic Christ who is shepherding his people across the Red Sea. 
After the war, Chagall was great, in greatly in demand, first of all, as an illustrator of Bible stories. Uh, that's his nativity. That's his sacrifice of Isaac, which is an important story, of course, for Jews as well as for Christians. The story of the hospitality of Abraham is a lovely depiction, very important for Christians, but also for Jews. And his familiar image of Jacob's ladder, uh, imagery which is very important again for both Jews and for Christians. And then after the war, he was even more in demand for his stained glass. This is stained glass at Mainz, uh, and this is, that's at Mainz, that's Mainz. And this is stained glass at Chichester Cathedral, based on Psalm 150, commissioned by the dean at the time, Walter Hussey, whom we'll be hearing more about in my fourth lecture. And one of the loveliest bits of, of glass, which some people here I know have seen, a little church in Kent, not far from Tunbridge and Tunbridge Wells, called Tudley. Uh, the owner of the local big house, the Davigold Goldsmith's daughter, was very sadly drowned in a sailing accident, and the family commissioned Chagall to do the great east window. And this east window has Christ crucified at the top, uh, the girl drowning in the water beneath, uh, and then riding uh, on her favourite horse past the crucifix up to heaven. And when Chagall went for the opening of that east window and looked around uh, and saw the wonderful space that this church offered, he offered to do all the other windows in the church without charge. And the side windows in this church are a, a really blissful, uh, abstract, mostly abstract, some semi-abstract semi uh, colours. This obviously doesn't quite do justice to it. But this tiny, unpretentious outside gives place when you go in to a kind of heaven inside and if it, it is a church which is well worth seeing if you haven't seen it. So that is again, that's another one of those ones of Tudley. You get some little bit more of the sense of the power of those colours there. Well, we come across now somebody very, very different. Cecil Collins who lived from 1908 to 1989. This is a self-portrait. Collins was born in Plymouth to parents who'd moved there from Cornwall. His father originally had a good job as an engineer in a laundry, and Collins said his childhood was exceptionally happy. However, the recession forced his father to work as a labourer on the roads. Collins had to leave school at 15 and was sent to work as a mining engineer. He hated it and left, determined to become an artist, he was offered free drawing classes at the Plymouth School of Art and then managed to win a scholarship to the Royal College of Art. And there he met his wife, who was to be a lifelong companion, support and muse, and it is her face which influences so many of his paintings. There you see the artist is in wife, painted in 1939 with a paradisal landscape in the back and a kind of chalice uh, in the table between them, indicating love and overflowing happiness. And you, if you look at the face of Collins's wife there, you'll see that it's very similar to the head of an angel, 1987, and the angel flowing with light, painted in 1968. Angels were a major theme of his painting throughout his life, for him, they were one of the archetypes, the primordial images, which belong to all cultures and religions and which manifest the divine to us. For him, they were not just images from the collective unconscious, as Jung believed, but as he put it, the winged thoughts of the divine mind. They were part of a spirit, universal spiritual reality, that paradise from which we'd, we'd been ex we have been expelled and to which we long to return. 
After the Royal College, Collins had critical and financial success with his own exhibitions in 1935, uh, and then as part of a surrealist exhibition. And looking at the biomorphic forms in his pictures, it is easy to see why he was identified as a surrealist. This is called The Promise, 1936, The Joy of the World, 1937, and Him, 1953. But he quickly dissed himself from them, as they did from him. As he put it, I do not believe in surrealism, precisely because I do believe in surreality, universal and eternal, above and beyond the world of intellect and senses, but not beyond the reach of humility and the hunger of the human heart. And he felt increasingly out of sympathy uh, with uh, the art of the time, not only surrealism, but with uh, modern abstract art. And he felt very artistically uh, isolated. Uh, in 1935, artistically isolated, he made the most important move of his life to Dartington Hall in Devon. First of all, he lived nearby, sharing in his life, but then during the war, when he took over the teaching of art into the hall itself. And the teaching was important because he found he had a natural talent for it, in a way that later developed the innate creativity of the students, and which later, when he moved back to London, made him one of the most popular and revered teachers at the Royal College of Art. Secondly, as he himself has written, it was there that I painted and drew many of my best works. This period was one of the most fruitful of my creative life, not only in writing, for I was also writing a lot, clarifying my thoughts. But it was in fact his wife Elizabeth who first drew a fool, but thereafter it became one of them, his most fundamental images. The fool as an image, of course, had been around at the time. It was a central image for Rouault. Um, but uh, he particularly, that is Collins particularly, valid, valued this image of the fool. This is called The Sleeping Fool, painted in 1943. There's another one, The Head of a Fool, 1974. This is The Pilgrim Fool, 1942. Um, uh, as Collins himself uh, wrote, uh, it was in the summer of 1939 Oh no, sorry, somebody else wrote about him. It was in the summer of 1939 that he came to see that what he most valued in himself was his childlike heart and that the true purpose of his keen analytical mind was defend his heart, not betray it. And as Collins himself wrote, the fool is the poetic imagination of life, as inexplicable as the essence of life itself. The poetic life, born in all human beings, lives in them while they are children, but it is killed in them when they grow up by the abstract mechanization of contemporary society. And not surprisingly, Collins was drawn to the teaching of Jesus that to enter into the kingdom of heaven, we must become as little children with their openness and capacity for simple wonder and of the world around us. So there we have the fool with the child, and there we have fool and flower, 1944. After the war, with no fixed home for a period, Collins had some commercial success in London, but the artistic climate was becoming colder for his type of painting. It was during this difficult time, from 1952 to 6, that Collins turned to more traditional Christian images. He had, however, already, and not unexpectedly, described Christ as the greatest fool uh, in, in history. Um, in this, The Agony of the, uh, in the Garden, uh, Christ has the same kind of half-moon face, which we'd seen in the earlier The Sleeping Fool, and the chalice to which Christ is uh, reaching up uh, is not just the cup of suffering of traditional iconography, for it appears in that unusual shape in the early picture of the artist and wife, which I showed right at the beginning of this series on Collins, where it sta clearly stands for the cup of inspiration and love running uh, over. Um, and uh, that shape is reiterated uh, in the shape of the bodies of Christ and his disciples below that uh, kneeling uh, Christ, which you can see there. 
Now, Collins painted two versions of this Christ before the judge. Uh, in the first, done in 1954, Christ is meek and submissive. In the second, done two years later, the figure of Pilate has become much fiercer, now with bared teeth and reflecting Aztec and African sources. He represents the mechanism of law against Christ, uh, now stratiated by the flagellation and wearing a very large crown of thorns. But Christ's eyes are wide open, revealing a strong, serene and eternal order that remains untouched by the harshness about him. This is the crucifixion of uh, Christ and where it contrasts the fierce points of the soldiers on one side with the jongleurs and the tambourines and the joyousness uh, of the other and Christ is looking down in favour on that uh, one side. Collins is said to have been struck by a remark of Goethe that it was a disaster to have an image such as that of the crucifixion at the heart of a civilization, and he shied right away from it uh, or, and wanted to focus on the more positive side of Christianity, like, for example, in this wonderfully vivid portrayal of res resurrection, where Christ, as a fool, soars up, upward in a, in a tourbillon of light, the crown of thorns transformed into a crown of glory. During this time, he also introduced a theme which was uniquely own, his own, with angel paying homage. Uh, sorry, that's a close-up of the of the uh, that uh, earlier wonderful image of Christ of tourbillon, uh, tourbillon of light going up. But he introduced his own image, unique image, angel paying homage to Christ. And then again in this very powerful image called the resurrection of the dead. Uh, over on the right as you look at the sleeping dead figures uh, and this wonderful resurrection dominating all. Now, Collins was a highly popular teacher, but his art, as I su suggested, was out of kilter with the prevailing taste for American abstractionism uh, after World War II in the 1970s. Uh, he was clear that art ought to have a theme. You couldn't just concentrate on form uh, alone. But a breakthrough came of a rather different kind when uh, he also was commissioned by Walter Hussey, the Dean of Chichester, um, to do an altar tapestry. At first, Collins was unwilling to undertake the commission, but soon saw it as a challenge to move beyond a purely personal vision of God to one which would engage a wide variety of the public. On the frame of the altar, the words from Revelation, Behold, I make all things new. And it was an image that nicely brought together traditional Christian themes about God as light with his own Neoplatonic understanding. Now, one of the canons of the cathedral at the time was Keith Walker, who, when he became vicar of St. Michael and All Angels Basingstoke, commissioned Collins to do windows for his church in Basingstoke. There's the close-up of the altar frontal at Chichester, and there uh, is, uh, are, are two of the side windows at Basingstoke. Because in addition to the big window of the Holy Spirit, he did these side windows on the theme of the eye of the heart. And at the dedication service for these in 1958, Collins said that he'd, been draw he'd drawn on a Sufi tradition, that in all our hearts there is an eye, as he put it. We are sleepwalkers, walking in the nightmare of the world, all real culture and real education are concerned with the existential knowledge of the opening of the eye of the heart, the one great basic need of our education and civilization. It is the eye that sees the world of angels, for like sees like, like attracts like. That's the big window there in, in uh, that church in Basingstoke. This is Fool and Angel Entering the City, 1969. After the section on the more explicitly Christian imagery in Collins' work, uh, it's uh, important 
uh, to note that what was even more fundamental for him, which was what can be short called in, in shorthand Neoplatonism. Platonism is based on the conviction that there is an eternal order to which we can have access through the great, three great absolutes of goodness, truth and beauty. There is a sense that in this world we are trapped or fallen and our task is to recover our lost paradise through union with the spiritual dimension to life. And it's not surprising that from the earliest days of Christianity, Platonism in one form or another has been seen as a friend and ally of the Christian faith and has often been taken into and merged with it. And it is this which lies behind Collins paintings of fools, angels, sunrises and so on. So this is fool and uh, angel entering the city in 1969. This is wounded angel. And this is the music of dawn painted in 1988. For both Collins and his wife, this view of life, this Neoplatonic view of life, lightly suffused with some Christianity, imparted a lightness, a joy, and an optimism about life. Once asked to sum up his attitude to life and his art, he replied, my face is set towards the dawn. And that is called the music of dawn. Well, now we come to somebody whom some of you have heard before, because I did a whole lecture before on Stanley Spencer, but I couldn't leave him out of this course altogether. So there are going to be just a few things about Stanley Spencer, because he fits so well uh, into the theme of distinctive individual visions, because he had a very distinctive, a unique understanding of, of the Christian faith. Uh, he trained at the Slade at a time uh, when drawing and clarity of line was emphasized, and he was a superb draftsman. His cozy, cozy secure childhood is reflected in all his paintings, and he made his living by selling paintings of scenes around Cookham. And in recent years, these have been increasingly appreciated, and there was a, an exhibition of these sort of paintings uh, in the summer. One of the main characteristics of Spencer is that he saw beauty in unusual places. And this beauty uh, had uh, usually had a very strong uh, sensual element. This is called At the Chest of Drawers, 1936, with a little Stanley Spencer below the lady looking in the, in the drawers. But he not only saw beauty uh, and sensuality in almost everything about him, he also saw the holy there, as in this painting of Sarah Tubb and the Heavenly Visitors, set, of course, in Cookham High Street, like so many of his paintings. Sarah Tubb had seen Halley's Comet and taking it to be a sign at the end of the world, knelt to pray. And there she is, kneeling to pray. And we see the same sense of holy in Cookham High Street in called Villagers, Villagers and Saints, uh, where the boy is playing with marbles, uh, the man at the back uh, has his, uh, his, his empty beer bottles there, uh, and the angels, the angels, the angels and villagers are all there together. And Spencer once wrote, when I lived in Cookham, I was disturbed by a feeling of everything being meaningless. Quite suddenly, I became aware that everything was full of special meaning, and this made everything holy. The instinct of Moses to take his shoes off when he saw the burning bush was very similar to my feelings. I saw many burning bushes in Cookham. I observed the sacred quality in the most unexpected quarters. This is one of his most famous paintings, Christ preaching at Cookham Regatta, uh, with uh, Jesus in the uh, punt, uh, kneeling forward, teaching. Uh, 
and he painted endless scenes from the Bible based in Cookham. There's this close-up of Jesus with his little people in the punt, children in the punt. This is the Last Supper, those amazing feet and legs just set in a, an old malt house in Cookham. And this is Christ carrying the cross. I'm sorry this image is not better. Actually, it doesn't come out too bad. It doesn't come out better than I feared. It was the best one I could do. Um, so what's dominating this picture, of course, is not just Christ carrying the cross through uh, the village with the sort of people almost like angels with the curtains looking out of their houses, uh, but two workmen carrying their ladders behind. And that carrying of ladders was very, very important to him because the Tate Gallery, where the painting is now, originally mistitled this picture, Christ Bearing His Cross, which intensely irritated Stanley Spencer. As he said, the false title implied a sense of suffering, which was not my intention. I particularly wished to convey the relationship between the carpenters behind him carrying the ladders and Christ in front carrying the cross each doing their job of work and doing it just like workmen. Christ was not doing a job or his job, but the job. And again, when Stanley Spencer's dealer thought of cataloging the, pa pa the, the painting under the title Christ, Christ Carrying His Cross, Stanley was furious. The cross for him was universal. We all have to carry the cross through the day-by-day -day things we do. This is the crucifixion, again set in Cookham High Street on a great pile of sand with Mary spread eagled over the sand. Villagers looking out from their windows. And uh, one, two, the two cre cre uh, thieves looking in agony behind on, on either side. But of course what is most extraordinary uh, is the picture of that man with his hat uh, banging in the nails. In fact, uh, two of them, of course, there. Um, and the reason is that with this painting, which was in fact the last major painting by Stanley Spencer before his death in 1959, and it was painted for the chapel of a school funded by brewers, Hence the brewer's cap on the men nailing Christ to the cross. And the painting caused a public outcry. And when Stanley Spencer went down to the talk to the school about the meaning of the painting, his remarks would hardly have helped the situation. He told the boys, it's your governors and you who are still nailing Christ to the cross. In World War I, after a long period of agonizing, he joined the RAMC, serving first as a hospital orderly, then in Macedonia, and then with the Royal Berkshires. Uh, and we see the results of his experience there in the Sander Memorial Chapel, which he painted between 1927 and 1932. If you've not been there again, it is a, a wonderful, wonderful uh, gallery of frescoes by Stanley Spencer. Some of them are scenes of uh, his time in the hospital. Uh, this, for instance, is making beds. Because he saw the holy in ordinary everyday activities, such as making bread, making beds, doing the washing up, uh, and, and, and so on. But the picture which dominates the Sander Memorial Chapel uh, is this, the resurrection of soldiers. It's not an easy painting to take in at first glance. Um, right at the top you'll find a little cry, cry, Christ and the soldiers are all ra being raised from the dead and bringing their crosses to Christ. In the centre is a, a little Stanley Spencer kind of asleep 
on a kind of collapsed wagon drawn by two donkeys. These are all, as so often, remembrances and feelings from his childhood, which have been brought into his painting. Over here are soldiers having risen from the dead, and what are they doing as soon as they've raised, been raised from the dead? They get back to their ordinary soldierly activities, cleaning buttons and polishing leather. Because for Stanley Spencer, that's what resurrection was about. It was about being raised into doing the ordinary things of life uh, in a way uh, which made you feel it was wonderful. And he was much influenced in his attitude to work by some words of St. Augustine about God always being at work and always at, at rest, which he thought of as God always fetching and carrying, but with an inner serenity. There is the little Stanley Spencer between the two mules and the collapsed wagon. There is the, a, I couldn't find a better illustration of that, I'm afraid. There's the little Christ with all the soldiers crossing, crosses coming. There is the soldier having raised from the dead, polishing his leather belt. Now, during World War II, Stanley Spencer was employed as a war artist. He went to Port Glasgow on the Clyde, 15 miles down from Glasgow itself, and he was fascinated by the communal life of the, uh, of the city. And he went into the great shipbuilding works, um, and the most marvellous paintings came out of his experience in those shipbuilding works, which are on display now, after some years out of public view, because they were being uh, refurbished and retouched, or rather restored. Uh, they are now at the Cookham Gallery, kick in Cookham itself, and I think they're there till January, and they are an absolute must-see. And Stanley Spencer said that when he went into this great shipbuilding works, he said, I was as disinclined to disturb them as I would disturb a service in church. Again, the sense of holy in, the, in people doing the work which they were, they were doing. These paintings were extremely well uh, received, even from the moment uh, that they were first, first uh, painted and shown. But also in Glasgow, um, he saw the cemetery there. Uh, and he said, it seemed to me full of, Glasgow seemed to me full of some inward surging meaning, a kind of joy that I longed to get closer to and understand in, in, in some way fulfill. And I felt that all this life and meaning was somehow grouped round and in some way led up to the cemetery on the hill outside the town. And I began to see the Port Glasgow resurrection that I have drawn and painted in the last five years. I seemed to see that it rose in the midst of a great place and that all in the plain were resurrecting and moving towards it. I knew that the resurrection would be directed from the hill. And so we have the same series of amazing resurrection paintings, of which I'm only just, I think, going to show uh, one because of shortage of, uh, of, of time. But that gives you the flavour. Here, here people are waking up after the, resu after the resurrection. And what's the first thing you do if you wake up after a long time dead? You give a great yawn. <laughs> and there the children, as always, are playing, playing around and need playing with. You rub your eyes. Now, this is part of my favourite uh, series, Christ in the Wilderness, uh, which is in the uh, Gallery of uh, Western Australian Art in, in Perth. Uh, this is obviously related to the saying in the Gospels, consider the lilies in the field. Uh, but I want to convey, I think has come across in his paintings, the, the intensity uh, of the feelings that Stanley Spencer had about life. And this can be gauged by a remark he once made, uh, probably about his friends, the Slessers. He said, I remember having some friends I was always meeting in the evenings and didn't see anything special about them until one day I went to have breakfast with them. 
and seeing them at breakfast gave me wonderful feelings about them. I was so overcome that I couldn't eat my breakfast, not even bread and butter. Now, if you think about that, remark, if you like, if you like your breakfast like I like I like my like my breakfast, you know, and somebody comes in and sits at the breakfast table, and, and that you're so overwhelmed by the reality and the holiness of their presence, the holy, the holiness of the ordinary, that you actually couldn't eat a thing, you can get something of the intensity of Stanley Spencer's uh, paintings. And I think that this uh, comes across uh, as much as anywhere uh, in this uh, final image that I'm going to show, which I think is my favourite from the Christ in the Wilderness series. What does Christ have in his hand but a scorpion? And look at the feeling of pity and compassion with which Christ is looking down at the scorpion that, skits, that stings. And it's interesting that Stanley Spencer once said about his painting, love is the essential power in the creation of art, and love is not a talent. Love reveals and more accurately describes the nature and meaning of things than any mere lecture on technique can do. And it establishes once and for all time the final and perfect identity of every created thing. This series of Christ in the Wilderness was painted at a time of great personal unhappiness in his life in 1939-40 when he went to live on his own in Swiss Cottage. But it was a time of incredibly intense spiritual awareness. And he said about that time, I felt there was something wonderful in the life I was living. I loved it all because it was God and me all the time. So I think that's all I will show in the way of images now so that we can leave a little bit of time for questions. We've seen then three very, very different distinctive individual visions. Chagall, who combined Jewish and Christian imagery in a unique kind of way, images so fresh, vibrant and popular, uh, an unknown, a lesser known uh, Cecil Collins, a kind of neo-Platonist, very, very distinctive vision in life, and finally Stanley uh, Spencer with his great vision of, of being raised to new life now so that you see uh, everything, however unusual, as holy.